Hi everyone, thank you very much for having me and um, yes, all that was said there is, is, is true. Um, so yes, other than being a lawyer, I then left um, the law and um, joined Techstars, so that is a, a clear um, sort of segue from what Rich was talking about to, to what I'm going to go and talk about. And then during Techstars, I, I met Shilpay and then moved on to Shilpay. Um, so uh, from my experience previously and from my experience on um, a number of uh, accelerator type programs and corporate development programs that we've gone through with Shilpay, I'd like to go through um, in uh, two slides um, a bit more about um, the startup's perspective on these types of uh, engagements. I'll then talk to you a little bit about how at Shilpay we've, uh, or not just at Shilpay, but how a few techniques that um, I've picked up or learned or been taught um, that could help your sales cycle, uh, improve that sales cycle, and particularly um, how I managed to get Rich to do some things with me at Barclays. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to introduce you more about what Shilpay is. Hopefully this works. Oh. Um, so Shilpay, our mission is to eliminate peer-to-peer -peer fraud, payment fraud on the internet, and allow everyone everywhere to transact in total confidence. We do that by using um, ID verification techniques and um, du dual authorization, strong authorizations, facial recognition to onboard clients um, from both sides of the transaction. And once both parties are verified, shield pay verified, we then allow money to come into the system and hold the funds until the moment that the parties agree the transaction has gone smoothly and the funds are released. We are authorised and regulated in the UK, um, but we've passed it out to throughout Europe. So we are available here to anyone that wants. Um, we do this for a number of different verticals. So we have marketplaces and mega deals. We throw that. So on marketplaces, it's peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, one on one, and then mega deals, it's buying a house, selling a company, fundraising. We do this through APIs and full integrations. All right, that's the picture over now. I'm going to move on to stuff that's more interesting, but I had to sneak it in. Right, so this is a, unfortunately a quite busy slide, but um, if we can take each line of that slide, um, I'd like to talk about the types of accelerator programs that are available. Um, so there are incubators and there are accelerators. Incubators um, are government-led often or corporate-led, but they don't take any equity. And these are great for an early, early, early stage company that isn't ready yet to um, give equity away or ready to commit fully. It's still a, a fledging idea. And then you've got the accelerators, the accelerators like Techstars, like Y Combinator, like 500 startups that are the big, big names. There are accelerators everywhere. <laughs> I know that in Lithuania, um, there's going to be a few accelerators starting soon from what I've heard over the last few days. And what's important to note there is that there is a lot of noise, and these accelerators take equity. So you've got to tread very carefully when you engage with that kind of entity. In the same, and when you engage with a corporate entity, or the corporate start path like MasterCard. I'll go on to say a bit more about what that is in a second. Um, but it's incredibly important to do your research on these kind of entities. In the same way that when you're um, pitching to a business, you need to do research on them. This is pitching to an investor, an accelerator. They ultimately are looking for a return on you. Techstars, for example, has over 150 companies on their portfolio, um, and, oh, sorry, 1,200 companies in their portfolio with a total market cap of $12.5 billion. These businesses are there to make money, and so they will push you in that same kind of direction, which is great in most instances, but maybe not for your business. Start path is a different type of entity totally, and it's more for scale-up companies. So um, as you see, there's some uh, Revolut, Rails Bank and Divido being big alumni of, of the StartPath program. And there, you engage with the entity directly in a, in a similar way that you do post-accelerator with Barclays, but here this is on its own. And what they do there is they allow you to speed up your sales cycle within MasterCard. They explore partnerships with MasterCard clients, and they allow you to showcase all your things to partners. So by way of example, we, um, through this program over the last seven months, uh, we've been introduced to banks in uh, looking for licensing our technology in Nigeria, in Kenya, 
in Singapore um, and in India through those relationships. We've had discussions with people um, through that program um, on a weekly basis, um, subject matter experts, your, your mentors, your internal champions that are constantly looking for opportunities for you to do. From a startup's perspective, it's great because we have a team of 16 now full time, but these kind of entities, much like uh, Barclays can do and many of the banks I'm sure do in their other innovation hubs, allow you to gain access to those sales forces to really push your product. So if you can get involved with these kind of pro projects, it really does give a real boost to you. However, on the flip side of all of this, um, these accelerated programs, particularly residential ones, take a lot of time out of your business. And not all of the companies that go through these programs will be successful. Um, many are, and many go and on and, and are successful, but you are, your valuation is raised credibly. Um, so when you leave that, you go, um, you're suddenly four times the value that you were, and then you have to meet those expectations. In terms of the time out, you and your team as a founder or co-founders spend three months away from potentially the rest of your team, which takes a huge amount of pressure on the business, particularly if, you've, um, if, you know, if you're already up and running. If you're prior to product release, then there's a lot of value there to be involved in one of these, but if you're already running a successful business, you need to, second, you need to question whether those three months that I spend on this, where I have to give all my all, um, are really worth it. So these are some things to consider. But for us, so I was on um, the accelerator, and during that period, um, I got to uh, help each of those companies. I was, as, as was kindly introduced, I worked with a lot of different tech companies, and there were other associates like myself, like mentors like Rich, who were able during that time to really to give as additional staff to those kind of entities, so to each of the startups which was a, a great experience from my side, but also all of the startups suddenly got subject matter experts for free on their doorstep. Each of these, um, each of the, during the textiles program, we had meetings with 88 different mentors in the FinTech space in London. Two of those mentors then, uh, but one, during that process, you, you pitch your idea 88 different times. You get knocked down every single time by these people telling you it's wrong, it's right. And bit by bit, you iterate your pitch to getting it correct. Through that program and through the guidance that you get, you, you really get to align your go-to-market strategy and how, how you're going to take this product to the next stage. And you also get introduced to great investors. Sorry. So, I mean, are there, um, how many people here have applied or will be applying to accelerator programs? Have anyone, well, perfect. And that didn't go the way that I, that I hoped. Um, but um, as I said, these programs are amazing, but there are other ways, um, government initiatives um, that help startups. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a lonely place trying to run a company. Um, and all the help that you can get is, is incredibly useful. I'm now going to move on a little bit um, to talk about um, fintech sales, hopefully a little bit more eloquently than I did the last set of slides. But as Rich was saying earlier, when you're tackling a big corporate, and we do that, we are, we are selling to e-com sites, marketplaces, banks, lawyers, we're selling to a whole range of different people and each of those have their own different nuances. But in each of those cases, the one thing remains true is that you need to identify who the decision maker is in that organization. You can't, um, and how do you do that? <laughs> that's, that's the most difficult thing. You can't just, you can cold call them on, on LinkedIn, that has actually worked. Um, you get a soft introduction by someone else that works, but it's asking the right questions when you have the first meetings of going, I, can you actually do this? Have you got the ability, the power, and the willingness to get involved with this? And in those considerations that they have, they have to think about what's in it for them within that organization. So I'm kind of terminate, help me help you. 
So the first is, when you're having these discussions with a corporate partner or, or, or contact, it's what, finding out what exactly they need to make them look good. Is it that they need specific, they have the budget ability or the brain, brain weight for it? So by that I mean, um, if you're going to a company and they find out that actually that person's KPIs are to reduce complaints, and that's what he'll, their performance will be on. They're not going to be interested with some innovative new way of um, increasing revenue because that's actually that's not what they care about. You then become on the lower pegging order of that project, of that person's priority list. So identifying exactly what um, they have as their remit is incredibly important. And then what is it that they need to sell back in? What information do they need? What things are, there, are they really looking for? Practice your pitch. As we heard earlier, it's incredibly important to get your pitch perfectly perfect when you're talking to um, the most important deal that you could possibly have. <laughs> I've, um, I heard someone talk about this sort of ABC method, which applies both to um, investing or investors as well as to, to sales. So the way this goes is um, you have your pitch and you categorize your targets, whether that's investors or clients, as A, B, and C. The A category are the people that you really, really want to get, but you know that you're not ready for. That's your, your unicorn type person. Your Cs are the people that you're not really targeting. You don't really care whether you get them or not. But if you got them, that wouldn't be so bad. And then the Bs are your target. And so once you split out your sales pipeline between those three types or investor decks, between those three types of people, you then try and arrange meetings with lots of Cs. Practice your pitch with the Cs. Find out what problems they have. Solve their problems. Figure that out from someone that doesn't necessarily matter so heavily for you. Then try and get meetings with As. They will test your assumptions, they will test what you're doing, and they will ask the most difficult questions that you could possibly have, but you'll have already practiced with the C's. And then the A's, they talk, everyone talks. The A's will then be like, well, no, thank you very much, but at the moment you're not ready for us, or we don't need this quite yet, um, but come back to us in the future. And then you've got, and then once you've done all of that, you go to the B's. And the B's talk to the A's and to the C's, and then you'll be pitch perfect. And so they will have heard about you. There'll be a little bit of noise potentially about you. And you'll have practiced that pitch so well that you'll have got all the responses necessary to uh, get that client. Another nice tactic is trying to get a yes in principle or soft circling um, during a, um, uh, a client meeting. And by that I mean is to try and get them to say yes to something. Going out of a meeting and them saying no is, is, is not good. But if you can get them to verbally commit to yes, anything, yes, then psychologically it's much more difficult for them to then refuse in the future. And by that I mean, so if you are in a meeting and they say, right now we could, well, you, you see that there are issues, things aren't going so well, um, they've identified issues that you haven't got enough traction, uh, you haven't got enough clients that your tech isn't up to scratch or you haven't done a pen test or whatever it may be. And then you flip it back to them and they go, that's their reason to, to, to sort of dismiss you. But if you flip that back to them and go, right, so you're telling me that if I come back to you and I've got a pen test, I've got this and I've got that and I've got all of these things that you've just asked for, done and ready to go, you'll say yes. And if you can get them to agree to something along those lines, you're able to get them in a frame of mind, a positive frame of mind, and psychologically, they're going to find it very, very difficult when you come back a week later to, with all of those things done, to say no. It won't work all the time, but at least it gets you uh, further along than you would have been if they'd said, if you just accepted their no. Is there a zero integration option? So everyone's building um, tech solutions that are all singing and all dancing. Um, we have a 
standalone version of Shield Pay as well as a integratable version. So uh, it's all built on, on APIs. But what I mean by that is, is when you're coming to a client and a client asks you, says that they don't need all of that, they already are using a third party for part of your solution and they don't really want to move. Are you able to offer them something still? So sell every part of your business, every part of your process, every part of your technology individually, because then you're able to get into the door. And once you're there, you can then cross sell the rest of your solution. So the way that we've effect, used that quite effectively is, is we, um, we offer uh, corporate escrow services. So quite boring, but it's um, we effectively, for law firms who are looking for, for large M&A deals uh, to, uh, to put money aside for a period of time, um, those services are called corporate escrow services. And currently there are only very few players in the market that do that. They're large banks and... Um, uh, it takes a long time and the process is a bit painful. But we're able to do that in 48 hours. That is not really what we want to be famous for, but that is solving a problem that they need. They need to be able to do that within a couple of days. And then once we're in with that, we're able to sell them our funds distribution solution um, for our M&A platform. Um, and this has worked very effectively in two instances where we came in first as a vendor for one thing, and now they're using us for all of the larger piece. So it's just, think about um, the things that you can do to uh, unbundle your tech. I think I've just been talking about that, sorry. Um, say yes as often as you can. Um, by that I mean a sales cycle with Barclays or with any bank or any large institution takes a really, really long time. If they talk to you and they say, no, well, the, there are things missing in your product or that, you are, um, that, that, that there are improvements that need to be made before that, you just say yes or different features that they need. Just say yes every single time because by the time that you've actually got to the next stage, that you've signed a proof of contract or that you've, uh, a proof of concept, sorry, or any kind of further engagement, uh, you'll have had time to build it. So say yes, uh, because that keeps you going in the momentum of that sales cycle. Bring in a complimentary vendor or customer. Um, you know your markets incredibly well and you know what other bits fit into you. When you go to a client with two people, that's far better than just with one person. There's a, the might of both of your solutions and both of your interests at heart. It also helps to have the backing of a, a large institution. Can you take, if you're creating fintech products, can you take your, your KYC and AML provider in with you? Well, they want that. Um, can you sell them in to somewhere else? If you sell one of your partners into a, um, into a business or someone else, they're more likely to give you that opportunity too. So they're more likely to go, right, well, oh, you know, we're, you know, we like Chill Pay, they're really nice guys, and um, um, we've been working with them too. That could be an interesting lead for you. So creating leads by using your complementary vendors or, 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 or your customers. So bring a customer to your potential client. Um, by that I mean is, is again, uh, taking the law example, is if you can identify someone um, that, want, that you want to take that, that wants to use your product, but they need someone else to be engaged with it, take your customer to them. We're looking at, um, on a more potentially more, more interesting side, on the marketplace or classified industry. And there, rather than um, you know, banging our heads against trying to get in and trying to change the way they're doing without giving them any proof points, um, we went and found their customers, got them to start using our platform at a reduced rate, and then went showing those slides and that journey and the comments of that particular user um, to the classified marketplace in question. And that got us in the door. That got us to move that thing forward. Continuously communicating with um, the people within the sales team that you're, you're dealing with is essential. But so with giving them lots of things that, is useful, that are useful. For the first ones, just 
just cover your costs. Um, you can change your pricing later. Uh, it's, you, can, you can go up and you can go down, but if you don't get the first ones in, you don't have any reference sites or anything to show people that you really do function. Just make sure you cover your costs, don't lose money. Try and never have a business model that loses money. But you've got to sell stuff, you've got to shift stuff. So just cover your costs. The corporate DD process um, is, is a painful, painful thing. Um, you have to go through layers and layers of people, of compliance, of, of, uh, of fraud prevention, and, and all these things. And, and you know, this has been uh, the bugbear of our lives for the last two years of trying to go through these processes over and over and over again. But once you've done them once, you can just recycle all of that stuff. Don't be shy to put pressure on the people within those organizations. Don't piss them off, but don't be shy to keep banging on at them. Um, Rich will tell you that I'd message Rich at six o'clock in the morning and then at midnight again, asking him where the next things happened and when, what's going on. I'm very lucky that I've built a good relationship with Rich at Barclays, but it's, it's still, um, you know, it, it's pushing forward as often as you can. I think um, Rich mentioned that I should talk more about what the, how, um, how our relationship with Barclays has been going on. So I'll, I'll take a little step away from the top tips and tell you more about that now and, and finish off on a couple more. So, so we've, we've engaged with Barclays on a number of, of different projects and um, these have taken a really, really long time to get across the line. Um, we did one, uh, we signed one proof of concept with them when we uh, left uh, Barclays Techstars at the end of the program. Um, and it was great. We were all very excited. We were only a few of us in the company at the time, and it, this was going to be great. Um, we went on and on and on for six months, uh, seven months. We put in a lot of resources, a lot of time. And then people within Barclays and the moved, moved somewhere else, moved elsewhere in the business. Um, and then there was a strategic change in how Barclays operated and what their priorities were. So all that work that ran resources by Barclays as well as us was lost completely lost. So that was incredibly painful. Um, on the flip side, we're now working on two other projects that have been able to be done far, far more quickly. And that really has been amazing because last week we were able to do, um, we were able to do the first house purchase via ShieldPay with Barclays putting money in as a lender, um, which is pretty awesome. We had, uh, uh, that was a really big moment for us and a real big validation um, of our relationship with Barclays. But we've done that first bit, it's a proof of concept, it stands as valuable as it is now on its own. It's taking it to that next step now, it's, it's setting out really every single step that we, we see we value we can bring to Barclays or to any corporate partner. Um, and how are we doing that? So um, we have set out a project roadmap that goes, you know, 12 months ahead. But we're also going to be going up to Barclays and offering effectively our services as free consulting to go and help their back-end office staff to try and map out improved processes. That is the hope, at least. But these things, you need to give a lot to these partners. You need to be willing to give up time, resources. But it does happen, but it does take um, a huge amount of effort. And building those relationships within those clients is incredibly important. Um, and it's great, you know, to be able to be here for a few days, a few days and, and, and spend time with Rich and the rest of the Barclays teams. It's always very good to, to do that kind of thing. So that kind of leads to don't put your eggs in one basket. So by that I mean given the time that it takes to do any of these projects and getting any of these things actually away, if you were to just rely on that, one client, you're screwed. You're never gonna, you're never gonna be able to go anywhere. So make sure that at every given moment, you take time to um, well, you allocate resources enough to enough clients or enough prospects to make sure that your sales cycle is there. Um, you can get really, really excited about programs that you're doing with these large partners, um, but you're just tiny little cog in their massive wheel. And so um, you've got to gauge that, that level of excitement very carefully.
again, relationships are, are king, as I was saying. So we, one of the things that we do that has worked really effectively for us in, in terms of our, uh, our sales cycle has been that when we have, we have a, a list of, of, I guess, friends of shield pay, we call it. And there's um, investors, obviously, who get, they're on a separate list as well, but they get investor updates on a, on a monthly basis. But then we have the friends of shield pay. And the friends of shield pay list contains, well, our investors, but also contains um, sales targets or people that we've had interview meetings with at different institutions, um, people that can effectively build the buzz about things that we're doing. It's, it's all about telling a story, saying that we're reaching milestones, we're getting this client, we're getting that client. Um, and we set this out, obviously the ones that we can say, um, others are on the confidentiality issues, uh, but, but putting those out means that people come back to you. People come back after months of not having been in contact and it was all in their court and then suddenly you keep sending these emails and then suddenly one thing or another excites them and they come back. Luckily yet, we haven't had anyone unsubscribe to these emails and with GDPR coming around the corner, we've made sure that, that that's all legit, but um, that has been an incredibly effective tool for us. So I encourage you all to, to start building out that list and building out that list not only from your own personal as founders or co-founders, but also from the rest of your staff. And that's not just the most important person in that relationship that you'll have with a client, but the next person or the person after that, because you don't know who will be running your project when it actually gets to the end. Um, so be mindful of all the people involved. Um, I'm done here, thank you very much. Um, but if you have any questions on, on any of the stuff I've talked about, um, and I've been going at a pretty frenetic pace, so I hope it was, it was clear, but uh, yeah, I'll open the floor to questions at this point. Well, thank you very much.